table, Jim will be sharing it. I might be able to get a word in edgeways. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it was worth coming all this way on the train. Trains have been rough today, but it was worth coming all this way just for those two speeches from Dan and the personal experience that you gave us. It was just I was so moved. It was so moving. Um, I think this is most probably for most of us uh, the most significant political period of our lives that we've experienced for. Well, maybe certainly for a generation. Um, I'll tell you why. I have to be really careful. Jeremy's warned me about um, <laughs> cracking jokes and, <laughs> and um, my language. And I'm not allowed to throw any books about anymore. <laughs> this thing about Mao's little red book. He said, he said why, did you, why do you throw the little red book at George Oswald? I said, well, the problem was Das Kapital is so heavy and there's so many volumes. <laughs> um, <coughs> let me take you back. So I think it's important we understand where we're at at the moment and what, what's happened. And we, we need to understand it. Now, the reason I say this is one of the most significant periods is because it's exactly as Darren said, because it is so significant at the moment about the future of our movement, our party, Socialism in this country, the future of the country itself. On Darren's point, is absolutely significant that we all have a responsibility on our shoulders now to influence events. And to influence events, we've got to understand what's happening and how we've got here. Now, literally 18 months ago, in May of last year, um, when we lost the election, um, we were all pretty despondent. And I can remember the day after that election that we lost. Even up until the election night itself, almost like the opinion polls, I thought we'd, even if we weren't a majority party, at least we'd be the largest party. And at that point in time, I thought there was some prospect, maybe, because we had a pretty good relationship, Jeremy and I, with Ed Miliband. I thought there was some prospect for the Socialist Campaign Group of MPs, the left group in Parliament, that would be able to negotiate, maybe someone at a junior ministerial level if we were in, in government. What then happened, as you know, we lost the election and Ed resigned. And Ed, I didn't want him to go. I thought Ed Miliband was a nice bloke. I thought he was a good bloke. I didn't like the way the media treated him. And certainly I knew his father. I didn't like the way they introduced his father the way that they did. Anyway, we went very, very quickly. And what happened then is there was a lot of pressure that came on us to run a left candidate for, for the leader. And we, Jeremy and I, convened two meetings, I think you got both of them down, we took, convened two meetings of all the left organisations you know, that, that we brought together and left trade unions to say to them there was no chance whatsoever that we would get a left candidate on the ballot paper. Now do not take racing tips from me. <laughs> um, what then happened is that we had two of these meetings and eventually um, we succumbed to the pressure that we should consider um, putting the candidate on, on the ballot paper. We sat down, I convened to meet the Socialist Group of MPs, sat around a table like this, and we went around the table to say, so who's going to be the candidate? Some of you know this story. I said, I, I tried twice, I couldn't even, I was so popular, I couldn't even get on the ballot paper. <laughs> um, Diana was there, and she'd ran last time, so I've done it once, I don't want to do it again. And literally, literally, Jeremy's at the end of the table, and we turn to him and say, well, it's your turn. And Jeremy's response was, oh, go on then. <laughs> uh, the reason I tell that so time and again is because it's so significant and it relates as well to what Darren said. See, I, I want a leader that you have to force to take the position. Because I work with 200 odd people, well, no, actually you include the Tories, 640 odd people who come into Parliament with a, a back of the envelope in their back pocket, which says MP by such and such an age, minister by such and such an age, prime minister by such and such an age. And our, we're overrun with careers mm -hmm. who just want to hold position yeah. rather than actually abide by principle. And what I wanted as a candidate was someone who would do it as a result of his commitment or her commitment to the principle and the policies and the the vision of society that we want. And that's what Jeremy's about. 
i've worked with jeremy now for over thirty years he's the most caring compassionate person i've met in politics and what you see with jeremy is what you get um extremely kind considerate person and he's introduced this new style for us that's why i don't like this all these allegations of bullying and threats and all the rest of it and somehow they try to associate them with jeremy corbyn it's quite the reverse as i say he's an extremely kind considerate person we're trying to introduce this new kind politics and um i'm part way through the jeremy corbyn course of um <laughs> kindness and politics um, in fact i had to go back a few lessons <laughs> recently um, because they get on your bloody nerves at times. <laughs> um, so what, what then happened, as you know, is we then had to get Jeremy on the ballot paper and, uh, and then we toured around talking to MPs. And some of you were involved in this, about contacting MPs and said, please just nominate him. We need 35 nominations. Just nominate him so that at least we can have a choice of candidates. Because at that point in time, I thought if we could get on the ballot paper, we may be able to demonstrate move 20 or 25% support and then on that basis we could negotiate, even negotiate a left winger into the shadow cabinet or something like that. We got, uh, we got a lot of you pressurising individual MPs and we got to the uh, final day of the ballots itself and we got to literally 10 minutes before ballots closed and we were up to 30, we need 35, we're up to 33. We'd done a deal with five members of parliament that if we got to th up to 34, they'd nominate us to the ballot paper. There were all sorts of deals done. Jeremy doesn't know about them. I didn't tell him. <laughs> uh, offered to sleep with people. Didn't work. <laughs> no one took the offer. Um, and we got, literally got within, uh, within a few minutes and uh, we had four of them standing there and they, a couple of them, we got to 33, not 34. And a couple of them cracked and said, okay, we'll nominate. And it was, Adam, it was um, Smith from Oxford and also, um, the guy from Blackpool. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll always be grateful to them because they, they gave us the opportunity of actually having the debate. So we started the debate. And Jeremy said, well, you know, what we'll do is we'll tour around the country together. And I said then, that I knows this, uh, I said, it, it would look like last a summer wine on tour. <laughs> we just did all that. Let's go out there, get you out there, put the ideas and I think we'll be able to pick up a fair amount of support but if nothing else we may be able to bring in a new generation of activists committed to the, the policies that we're advocating and that's how it happened it literally was just like that mm. and we started I did the usual um, thing we started I chaired the campaign we started booking halls around the country not like this I said the usual thing book a hall where you've got no more than 100 chairs at best and make sure you can pull them away so that if only 25 turn up and pull the chairs away <laughs> You still look packed and move about a bit. <coughs> we did our first meeting, that sort of thing, 500 people turned up. I thought there's something different here, something's happening. Jeremy did a speech, lots of um, engagement from, from the community and, and discussions, etc. And what was interesting, the people that turned up weren't existing Labour Party members, they were existing Labour Party members, trade unionists, and a large number of others, particularly young people, turning up. We then started booking halls of 500 and 1,000 turned up, 1,000, 2,000 turned up. It was extraordinary. And I, I, I joke about it, but it's true. One of them, there's a brilliant film in, in the Bidborough Centre in Camden mm -hmm. where the hall's packed out with 2,000 people and in the street, it's, the street is packed. Matt Rack from the FBU brought the fire, their fire engine there. Jeremy spoke from the fire engine. And there's a film of two youngsters breaking into the hall. When have you ever heard that? <laughs> Young people breaking into a physical meeting. It's just extraordinary. And what happened in the, those meetings shaped the political programme that, um, that we discussed throughout that and that Jeremy put forward, also the political programme that we've been campaigning on ever since. And it was based upon, it's exactly as we heard today, it was based upon people's experiences. Because we had people turning up and saying, we haven't got a roof over our heads, or we can't afford the rent, or we can't afford the mortgage, and people turning up who've been evicted as well. So this is 2015. I represent a working class, multicultural community on the west of London, near Heathrow, that I've lived there for nearly 40 years now. Tonight, in my constituency, 200 families will be in bed and breakfast. I will, in my constituency tonight, 
there will be families, families who are living in sheds and garages rented to them. Beds in sheds. I will have overcrowding on a scale we've not seen since the Second World War. We've reinvented the back-to-back -back in my constituency, where the front of the house is rented to one family, the back is rented to another. Average rents in my constituency now are between 1,400 and 1,600 pounds a month. <gasps> in the, in the, along the canal, there will be people sleeping. We have people sleeping in tents every now and again with the North Parks as well. Overcrowding on a scale that pushes the kids out onto the streets, and what then happens, they, they say, that, you know, they condemn the kids for joining gangs. The kids are on the streets and they join gangs because that's where they are. Mm -hmm. That's 2015 when we were discussing this, worse even in 2016. It's a scandal. And it's interesting, properties are being built on a huge scale in my area now. Huge scale. A lot of them are cash bought. Two thirds are cash bought. They're bought by foreign investors. Yeah. Because they're valuable properties, even without renting them out, their value goes up in such a, on such a scale that they're worth that investment. It's a scandal. So when, when we discuss it, and I've been through the same experience, I, I come from Liverpool, which I lost the accent when we moved south for work and all the rest of it. I was exactly the same. We, when I was a kid, we lived in a Tenement, it sounds like Monty Python, this outside <laughs> toilet. And all that. But I remember the day when we moved out, and we moved first of all into a council prefab, and I remember when we moved into a council house, Parker Morris Standards, me and my brother had our own bedroom for the first time, garden front and rear, and it was a day of celebration. Celebration. Families in my constituency can't celebrate anymore because we haven't built a council house for 30 years. Mm. So the solution that emerged from discussions like this was very straightforward. We will build houses again, and we will build council houses again, mm. and we'll build them on a scale that we haven't seen for a generation. Simply. <laughs> take time some areas to build the houses that we need so we will need in the meantime whilst rents are going up on that scale we will need rent controls mm. now somehow some of the media are thinking this is revolutionary we used to have rent controls in this country we used mm. to have a policy called fair rents yes. the rent officer would come around and assess it mm. it happens right the way across europe germany france and elsewhere why because housing is such an essential need and it shouldn't be used to make vast profits out of it and I tell you, in this country, in this, in this country, we have 700,000 700, properties standing empty. 300,000 of those are standing empty for over six months. We believe if there's a family that's homeless, there's an empty property standing empty for a long period of time, it's a social crime. Yeah. So we want to empower and resource local authorities to enable them to take over those properties and put those families in. So that's the solution. None of the discussions that we had last year that we then translated into policies were particularly revolutionary. We had, we had young people turn up who were basically large numbers of them, ambitious, wanted to go to university or go to apprenticeships, etc. They'd been cut back with the EMA being abolished and some of them, were, their families were finding it significantly hard to keep them in education. But all of them came up, came to us with ambition. But a lot of the discussions that we had were some of the students who were, who were already students would say by the time they'd finished university, actually by the time of that they would have the debts of anything between 30 or 50,000 pounds. Absolute scandal. The principle that we've always advocated as socialists, but also I think even, even just progressive liberals, is that education isn't a commodity to be bought and sold. It's a gift from one generation to another. Yeah. So that's why. Oh. That's why we are adam absolutely adamant that in the life of the next parliament we will abolish tuition fees once and for all. Yeah. Hey. We want to create an education.
education service in the same way that Bevan created the NHS. We want a national education service that from cradle to grave is free. So anyone can access it. Uh, already we're developing the policies around free childcare, but also that opportunities that people have throughout education, yes, into higher education, but also the ability to get apprenticeships, but also people to be able to return to education to improve their quality of life throughout their period of life. We talk about an iron bev, and I tell you, we've got a young woman who stepped into the shadow cabinet this time who is an absolute heroine. I don't know if you've seen her on TV yet. Mm. She's a young working class woman called Angela Rayner. Yes, yes. 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 And she's taken a lot on grammar schools, etc. That woman will be the an hour in bev and a bar. Yeah. next government because she'll take that policy into a national education We had lots of people coming from the health service, we had lots of nurses, we had junior doctors and others coming onto the meetings themselves and we had people who've also served on various bodies in the health service and they explained, the, the workers in the health service explained the pressure that they were under as a result of privatisation and cutbacks that were going on. And we had a range of people with real expertise about what was happening as a result of the scale of creeping privatisation that was happening and the cost burden that was putting on people. And how we'd seen in some areas the close of A&Es, the, ration, the rationalisation of the, the health service delivery and what that meant for individual communities, particularly where there was geographical breadth, if you like, between those, those facilities. And it was as a result of chronic underfunding over a long period of time, but also it was as a result of the privatisation, the resources going in. The scandals, I have to say it, but Jeremy and I opposed it from the day one it was introduced on the New Labour, the scandals of PFI, where they were making massive profits at the private finance initiative. So we said very, very clearly, what's the solution? The solution is we will end all privatisation in the NHS. Yeah. Yeah. End it. review all PFI schemes and to be frank on the PFI schemes that were signed mm. up some of them it's worth buying back and bringing them back in mm. because in the long run it, it, it will be cheaper. It just went on like that. The meetings that we were having throughout that period. We had teachers turning up talking about what the pressures they were under at the moment. <coughs> We've lost 50,000 teachers in the last period as out of the education service. We can't fill training places for teachers at the moment. Why? Because large numbers of people in that workforce are extremely demoralised because the pressures that they're under and the teaching to the tests that they have to undertake yeah. with the lead tables or SATs and all the rest that, that are going on. And again, what we were trying to say to them is that the academisation processes that were taking place under the, under the Tories was actually a first step towards privatisation. Mm -hmm. So that's why we successfully defeated the Tories on their forced academisation legislation that, that they were being through. Not acknowledged by some within the Labour Party, but that was a significant victory for us. But we said very, very clearly what we need to do is make sure that we invest in education, that we actually we listen to the professionals themselves, and we, we develop it in a way in which I suppose you're developing kids who have a quality of life rather than just turn up and pass a particular exam on a particular day. And our big fear is that atmosphere of teaching to the test would encourage the Tories to do exactly as they're doing now, which is to bring forward back the old grammar school system, which was, wasn't education, as we've said. It was segregation at the age of 11. Yeah. And then, um, those are the sort of policies that came out of the discussions that we had. And I thought it was really invigorating because it was a really real discussion based upon people's real experiences of the world, how they felt, their ideas of how we should solve them. Jeremy, in the campaign, we put that together as a political program. Interestingly enough, what came up time and time again was this issue about having confidence and belief in a Labour leader going back into power and committing themselves and, and implementing the policies that they've given and the promises that they'd undertaken. And part of that was around that lack of confidence in whatever a politician says at the moment. Now that's been within our society for quite a while, but a lack of confidence and belief, particularly in Labour politicians, to be frank, yeah. significantly undermined by the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think people were so disillusioned about what happened on Iraq wasn't some emotional outburst or whatever, is because most people, I think, and the millions that marched, understood what was happening. 
that we'd linked ourselves to the most reactionary president in the US had seen for quite a long time, mm -hmm. and that literally we'd become almost a neo-colonial neo power, if you like, alongside them, taking over vast areas of the of Middle East. For strategic gain, yes, but also ambitions, particularly the oil companies, for, mm. for a pecuniary gain as well. So one of the commitments that Jeremy gave, not just because of his history in campaigning against the war, but because of the reaction of people saying we've got to be, have faith in our politicians again, was that never again, never again will the Labour government take us into a military adventure in such an irresponsible way, which eventually results in half a million dollars. I had a slight contretemps last night with Alistair Campbell. Uh, <laughs> but I went through that period in, in Parliament with the dodgy dossier and all the rest. And I remember the pressure that was applied to Labour MPs that were to, to vote for the war. And it is about leadership. Now, there's a brilliant article that's been written for The Guardian today. It's on the website. I don't know whether they'll publish it tomorrow by the author, Roman Bennett. Roman was involved with this in a whole series of campaigns over the years. And he wrote a an article today about what real leadership was. And he traced real leadership, compared with Blair and Brown and Theresa May and Thatcher and all the rest of it. He traced real leadership in Jeremy's career over the last 30 years, where you stand for what is right, despite all the pressures coming against you, even if you're on your own, if you believe it's right, you stand for it. And if you look at this very history, if you look at Jeremy's history, that's what he's done. And that's the sort of leadership I want. Mm. I want leadership based upon principle that is adamant it will not be broken by the, I suppose, just the winds of public opinion at different times, or the pressures within Parliament or the influences that will come out from outside the Parliament, whether it's in the City of London or elsewhere. So by the end of that campaign, by the end of that summer, uh, we went into the QE2 for the results. All our canvassing had said, uh, were telling us that we, were, that we had 60% of the poll. I didn't believe them. Uh, I, I kept on retraining our canvassers. They were all volunteers. I didn't believe them. So there's no way we're going to get 60%. I'm a person who in 1992 lost my, uh, never failed to win my constituency by 54 votes on four recounts. So I'm not the most optimistic about <coughs> elections. So we went in there and we won on 59.5% of the vote. I told the cameras that they got it wrong, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> when Jeremy went out, that's the biggest mandate from rank and file member of any political leader in this country in our history. It's the biggest vote any political leader in any political party has got on a one person, one vote mandate like that. When he made that speech, and this is what I think what's so significant really, because they, they talk about this coup being launched only a few months ago. It wasn't. It was launched, exactly as Darren said, within minutes of him speaking. When, when Jeremy got up to make his thank you speech, within two minutes of him speaking, across the television screens, mm. there was a sort of a ticker tape thing of shadow cabinet members resigning and refusing to serve. Mm. I've never seen that before no. in our political history, where you have a newly elected leader and within two minutes, people are refusing to serve the party in that way. And it was great. a disgrace, to be honest. Yeah. It was a disgrace. And the coup started then. The coup started then. There were a small group of members of the Parliamentary Labour Party who were never going to accept Jeremy's mandate, never going to accept it. And they've been plotting ever since. I won't describe how useless they are in the terminology I've used before, um, <laughs> but they are pretty useless because when they meet, they tell us. And people tell us what's happening. And we've known what's been going on. It's exactly as Dan said. We knew that they would seek to use the Oldham by-election as the first attempt to bring Jeremy down. Yeah. They were arguing that we'd be hammered in the uh, Oldham by-election, and that would trigger the opportunity then of him forced into resignation. Well, the problem was we won the old election, and we won it significantly. And I think it's a real lesson. We won it on a really good local candidate, Jim McMahon. Plus the enthusiasm that Cor Jeremy Corbyn brought to the campaign, 
and so it was a combination of the sort of traditional labor party members with a good local candidate plus all the new members that come in and yes momentum sending buses into the constituency and we won a resounding victory and actually when Jim McMahon got up and thanked everyone for that he thanked the momentum members he thanked Jeremy and it was an almost like an ideal type of how to win these elections you combine the traditional party the members that have been with us all those years and congratulate them but you bring in the new members you enthuse the whole organization you get out there and campaign you win so the next opportunity they thought to undermine Jeremy and get rid of him was the mayor elections and local government elections and again they thought that we're going to lose those and the coup will then occur and Jeremy will be forced out so we won every mayoral election every mayoral election we won there was a lot of publicity around um, Sadiq Khan in London which was great and we mobilized on that because in London we, we've a huge mass membership now but the victory for me that was the most significant to be frank was Marvin Rees in mm. Bristol a black man winning in Bristol a city that was whose wealth was based and built upon the slave trade now for me that showed just how far we'd come in terms of equality within our society and just what a significant step that was forward and to beating an independent candidate as well and putting him on the basis of a political platform which to be frank reflected Jeremy's campaign the previous six months before in local government they told us we were going to lose the councils we had, they had a whole list they were being briefed the media were being briefed by a small minority of the PLP about how many council seats would lose what councils themselves we held on to every council and we matched Ed Miliband's highest council performance ever throughout his period and remember these highest was when the recession was at its depths and the Tories were the most unpopular and yet we matched that so we we'll let we can have the parliamentary by-elections we won every parliamentary <coughs> by-election we increased our majority significantly in three out of four so the coup couldn't take place because we were winning what then happened, we were told, is that the next attempt would be after the European referendum if it went wrong. And what happened from then on is that Jeremy was being set up by a number of them in case it did go wrong. Because already at the beginning of the campaign, they were already arguing that Jeremy was not sufficiently euro fine, etc. We sat down in September, soon after the Jeremy was elected, with Hilary Benn and Angela Reid, and we said, you can run the campaign if that's what you want because they were quite insistent but we said to them if you run too much of a europhile campaign without acknowledging some of the criticisms of the european union and putting forward solutions we will lose because our argument yes is you campaign for remain but also you campaign for reform and on that basis we felt we had a platform we could win on but we also said if you do appear on platforms with the Tories, they will brand us as the establishment, just as they did in Scotland. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. And then they argue that Jeremy hadn't done enough. Mm. He did thousands of them. He did more meetings than any other member of the parliamentary they part with the shadow cabinet. Of course he did, because he was the leader. Where was Theresa May? I never saw her in the campaign whatsoever. So in terms of, exactly as Jeremy said, in terms of Nicholas Sturgeon, we matched the SNP on the delivery of our vote. Anyway, what happened then is that we lost it and I, we regretted it deeply about the, the loss. But what then happened on that Saturday is that we got word from the press, the Observer contacted us to say that Hillary Benn was phoning around urging members of the Shadow Cabinet to resign. So we knew the plot was happening, we knew the coup was happening. Jeremy tried to get hold of Hillary, didn't get hold of him until about midnight, tried to track him down. This is Jeremy Corbyn, it wouldn't have been me. Jeremy Corbyn said to him, withdraw the proposal. We'll make a joint statement, stay in the shadow cabinet. Hillary refused, so he had no other option but to sack him. But then what then happened is an hour after that, the first wave of shadow cabinet members resigned. And the strategy was that they would resign wave after wave after wave to destabilize. So after the first four went, we thought, fine, we'll fill those places. Then an hour later, another four went. So by the time we got to the morning, most of the shadow cabinet had gone. What Jeremy did then was what any other leader would do. They thought he would resign. Mm -hmm. They mistake the man. Mm -hmm. They absolutely yeah. mistake the man. Yeah. 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 This, idea, this idea that it's some cult or anything like that, 
and this, you know, the man of steel. It, it wasn't that. He refused to resign because he didn't want to let down the people who'd elected him, the rank and file members. Mm -hmm. so what we did then is that we appointed a new shadow cabinet. I'm watching the train time, don't worry. <laughs> he appointed a new shadow cabinet. And a lot of the youngsters came forward, the Angela Rayners, the Becky Long Baileys, the Richard Bergen, the Five Birds, the Patsmans. And I tell you, they're the heroes and heroines yeah, of our Yeah, they yeah. are, yes! They really are. And they've done, <laughs> and they've done, a, they've done a brilliant job. They've done a brilliant job. The bright young things, Richard Berg and all that, they're absolutely bright young things. They've done a brilliant job. Becky Long Bailey is my number two, she's now Chief Secretary. She took over in the middle of the finance bill, the most complicated bill in parliamentary history, these are. She took over in the middle. Why did she take over? Because during the Finance Committee bill, the shadow minister who was supposed to be dealing with it resigned on camera. Resigned in committee on camera. Text, I'm on the front bench in the chamber. Text me saying I'm resigning. Before I could get up the stairs, he'd resigned already. Becky stood up, stood in. He'd wiped all our um, briefings from the database as well, which wasn't particularly helpful. Becky came forward, took over, and I tell you, at the end of that bill committee, you know, sometimes this happens in Parliament, every other party and everyone else in that room congratulate her for the work that she did. Because it was professional, but also political, in the sense of putting the arguments across. It was superb. <laughs> and then, and then, we've since then, We've managed as a parliament, in terms of parliament, as an administration. We've beaten the Tories on a number of issues in this last year. On more, we've defeated them on policies on more occasions than any other Labour administration I'm aware of, certainly under the Miliband administration. You know, PIP, the cuts for disabled people, tax credits, the issues around the trade union bill, we've pushed them back on that. And yes, we've been able to, we've not been able to defeat them in the Commons that often. We've been able to soften them up in the Commons and then the age of our colleagues in the House of Lords. It's a bit ironic for me because I've been trying to abolish the place for 30 <laughs> years. So, uh, I think we do need a second chair. But we, even in parliamentary terms, it isn't, it isn't just that we've won the elections. It isn't just that Jeremy's shown a different type of leadership. But even in parliamentary terms, we've been winning. And that's the tragedy at the moment. Mm. That's the absolute tragedy. This mm. leadership election mm. was completely unnecessary. Yes. Absolutely. And the irony of it was, it was triggered at a parliamentary day party meeting, where people are getting up to say to Jeremy, oh, I agree with your policies, you're a nice bloke, you're not a leader, you, we can't win elections with you. The irony of it was, at that parliamentary day party meeting, item number one on the agenda was to welcome the candidate for Tooting, who's tripled her, her majority in winning a by-election. Yeah. It was just bizarre. Yeah. So where we're at now is we've, you know, we've, they've triggered the leadership election, we've got a few days to go. Throughout the campaign, Jeremy has been his, his usual self, he's toured all around the country. We think he's spoken to this summer, maybe about 90,000 people, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We've got an electoral cap on how much we can spend, so a lot of the meetings that have been done have been in the open air. Some of you have seen the, the films in Liverpool, the Sound Centre, completely closed down by people there. Ramsgate the other day, on the beach, 2,000 people. The only thing that shut him up was the tide coming in. It was <laughs> Phenomenal what's happened. And why is that? Why is that? I think there's a number of reasons. Hmm. One, last year he won because people wanted hope and they wanted change. They'd had enough of us going along with neoliberal economics. They'd had enough of us adopting austerity-like policies. They'd re people realised that if we're going to tackle the real issues facing our community, particularly working-class people, we need socialist policies that will invest in the long term in our public services, that will introduce a fair taxation system, that will enable us to tackle some of the longer term issues like climate change that we face. And people are inspired by that. This time round, they're still inspired, but there's a grim determination because people understand what's gone on. Mm. What this election is all about is the establishment telling you and me how dare you elect a socialist leader. That's what yeah, this is yeah. about. Yeah. They're telling you. Yes. Yeah. It's the one percent, like in Occupy, it's the one percent telling the ninety-nine percent get back in line, yeah. get back in your box. Because yeah. what they want, they want to return to a politics yeah, where where Labour leaders might make big statements. 
are easily incorporated and never delivered. They want yes. to return to a politics where the politics is just the rotation of political elites yes. that have yeah. no connection whatsoever yeah. with the transformative politics that we need in our society today. Yeah. Yeah. That's what this leadership election is all about. So next week, I'm hoping, despite everything that's come at us, and the media, as you know, have most probably not been the kindest to us. <laughs> and it, for Jeremy, it's been appalling, absolutely appalling, outside his house all the time, harassing his family and all that sort of thing, digging the dirt wherever they can. They, and they have with Jeremy, let's be honest about it. They went back four generations, found his an uncle ran a workhouse, and I said to him, what a swine you are, Corbyn, for that. <laughs> with me, Darren knows this story, with me, they've gone round all my, I was married before, they went to my ex-wife and her, her, her husband, they're really good friends, the Daily Mail offered them money for an interview, and they phoned me up and said, oh, we sent them packets, I said, you should have taken the money, you got a holiday out of this. They put an advert, we went and lived in Norfolk, for they put an advert in the Eastern Daily Press, we moved from Liverpool as a kid, I said, do you know John MacDonald? And someone wrote in and said, I sat next to John MacDonald when I was at primary school, and he used to whisper the maths answers so I didn't get caned by Sister Pancratius. <laughs> I thought that was really moving. I was <laughs> they then tweeted out, wrote out, always knew he was a cheat. <laughs> so they come at us all the way. But I tell you what's been interesting, despite that whole barrage of the media, I, I tell you, don't think The Guardian is supportive. No. 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 As a liberal newspaper, we've been monitoring what's been going on, yeah. the supposed liberal newspaper. They've been as bad as some of the worst yeah. ones. Yeah. And as far as that, I'm a secretary of the MUJ group in Parliament. Jeremy and I set it up to campaign for journalists and to campaign for the BBC. <laughs> the BBC has been appalling. Last night there was a conference in London in which they produced the academic reports on the monitoring of the media and the BBC. And what they said is the media in this country, I'm Jeremy Corbyn, have moved from a, a media that's meant to be the, if you like, the, the monitor of what goes on, yeah, into no, no. one that's become an attack dog. Yeah. And yeah. that's exactly what's happened. And it includes, it includes the BBC. Yeah. I won't comment about question time, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just oh. Mr. Dimbleby and me, and we'll have another conversation. But despite all of that, despite all of that, I think what's happened is people who had hope last year still have that hope of a new politics, the opportunity for them to engage in a transformation of our society. But also, I think this year, they've got a determination. Yeah. Yes. They're not going to walk all over us again. We're going to stand up and we're going to vote for the leader that we want. And then when we re-elect him, we're going to stand by him so that whatever they throw at him, we're going to support him because it is an attack on just him, it's an attack on all of us. Yes. All of yes. Us. Yes. We, I'm, hope, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that Jeremy gets a bigger mandate next year. Yes. Week. Now, I think the vast majority of the Parliamentary Labour Party just want to get on with the job. I'm hoping for that. There's arguments about shadow cabinet elections, etc., and we know that some of them want to use those to ensure that they surround Jeremy and try to control him as a result of if he, if he does win. There might be um, some ambition to get rid of me. You never know on these things, do you? But we're saying to them in terms of shadow cabinet elections, let's, let's talk about that. Let's not, you know, it's not, elections are not a bad thing, they're a good thing. But let's talk about that, whether or not the shadow cabinet should be broader. Whether or not the shadow cabinet should have elections for some, not all. Who elects the shadow cabinet? Yeah, yeah. What about the members yeah. electing yeah. the shadow yeah. cabinet? Yeah. And that way, and that, and that, we want to open up the discussions to bring people back together again. And I think we can. I think we can. But we have to have a spirit of comradeship to do that. Because what's interesting, and I don't put, put his finger on it, all through this leadership debate, the most common expression I've heard from Owen Smith is that I agree with Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> because there doesn't seem to be anything by way of poli real politi policies or politics that distinguishes us. Some differences over tribe and odds and ends like that, I think they're significant. But on most policy areas, we're at one. There's been no challenge to the changes that we've made over the last 12 months. Because I think they recognise 
those policies are tackling the real world issues in their constituencies that desperately need it. But in addition to that, we'll get them re-elected at the next general election. Yeah. So we're hoping now that Jeremy gets re-elected with a stronger mandate, that we come together in unity, and that actually then we work on a system whereby we develop the policies, the campaigning mechanisms that enables us to win the next election whenever it comes. Yes, we need to learn lessons. We've made some mistakes, of course, and we need to learn lessons from one another. But we want to do that in a way which ensures that we build the movement as well. Town has put his name on, uh, has mentioned it. We're now the biggest political party in all of Europe. 600,000 members now. I think in the next 18 months we could go to a million. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. We could have party members on every street in every community in this country, mobilising for us, advocating the policies, making sure that people feel engaged, and when that election comes, we give ourselves a mandate and a majority that will enable us to transform this country. And I just say this what we're about. I want to ensure that the society we create is radically fairer, more equal, more democratic. Yes, as a as, as the person responsible for the economics of our party, based upon a, a prosperous economy, but a pros an economy that's sustainable both economically and environmentally. But above all else, where that prosperity is shared by all. <laughs> shared by all. I call, I call that socialism. Yeah. Solidarity. Yeah.